Now, if that wasn't hot identifiable right enough, there. hot new track from Tom Morello, <laughs> new up and comer. You might have heard of uh, Rage Against the Machine, Audio Slave, Social Street Sweeper, Night Watchman. He's played with Bruce Springsteen, and near and dear to my heart, he's also a Cubs fan. Yes. Tom Morello is here with yeah. us, folks. Yeah. Tom, still have right in, my friend. This is uh, sure. So this old is time a, friend. this is old time friend. Yeah, I'm out on tour with the Atlas Sun, touring for the Atlas Underground record, and I've, I've traveled for a lean and mean way. This is my. Um, long time ago Telecaster that uh, I needed a, when I learned how to do sort of grunge tuning, which was drop D tuning, I needed a guitar to do it. At the time I only had like locking nut machines like this. Uh, and so I traded my roommate at the time, he had this Telecaster and I had a 50 watt Marshall head. So we made an even swap. And from that day forward, I started you know doing the drop D tuning. This is, um, this guitar was playing on every drop D song uh, I've made, this is my 19th record, the Atlas Underground, and all 19 of them, any song that's in drop D tuning was played on this. Uh, Some of your heaviest riffs, Cochise, yeah. Freedom, Killing a Name, uh, people associate being those the heaviest things. Yeah. Single coil well, it's all guitar. Single, all single coil Just kind of like yeah, uh, I mean, this, page style. Exactly, exactly. That's the thing is like to, to play, um, and it's one of the things that I think made both Rage, Audio Slave, and my riffs wherever they occurred heavy in a different way in that kind of Jimmy Page way where they're springier and they're funkier and they make the, you know, 50,000 people jump up and down more than just sort of a more traditional metal, super metal, double humbucker scene. So this guitar, I mean, for example, has, um, uh, we, can, uh, we can take you through it, there's not much to it. It's like it's fully stocked. I put some stickers on it. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it allowed me to um, do a number of things, uh, you know, like when, for example, the riff "Killing the Name" was played on this on this mm -hmm. guitar, uh, and it just when you do the drop D tuning, it just sort of reconfigures the fretboard in a way and makes you think differently. The dots, where the dots are, you put your finger on a dot, it sounds different on when it's drop D. Yeah. So I was actually giving a guitar lesson to a fairly accomplished Hollywood guitar player. This is you know back in the earliest days of Rage Against the Machine, and um, showed him how to tuned a drop D, and in demonstrating it, I did exactly what I just told you, which was it reconfigures the fretboard and makes your fingers go in different places. The riff that I just made up extemporaneously was this. I said, hold on one second. I got my little Radio Shack tape recorder, pressed record on it, tucked it away, continued the lesson, then brought it, that into rage rehearsal the next day. History is made. There you have it, man. There you have it. <laughs> <laughs> but why did you stop at drop D and not explore further tuning in that regard? Or do you just well, like I mean, there, there are some, there are some, there are some drop B songs on some of my records. But then, you know, I, I, I sort of a traditionalist in a way. And when it start, people started going to drop Z minus, I thought I'm going to let them have that lane all themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Stay in your lane. Yeah. And uh, what strings do you typically use? Uh, these are one? I have tens on this to make to give it a little bit uh, help it stay in tune okay. uh, with the drop yourself. There's tens on uh, always tens on this one, and it still gives it enough you know <laughs> bendability up there and to be able to kind of be slinky and dexterous while at the same time holding down here. <laughs> Now, do you typically ride in the neck position, or are you kind of always one hundred percent of the time in the neck really? position? Really, one hundred percent of the time. Why do you feel that? I don't know. It's just like it's it. It felt like the riffs to me felt like like kind of funkier and springier and heavier down there. And on all my guitars, it's always the you know, unless it's playing the shredding. Yeah, and even on this guitar, like when I do the solos, it's always on the rhythm pickup as well. Huh. Yeah. Habit, force a habit. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Atlas Underground, what are songs that maybe people will recognize for this sure, guitar? Sure, sure. I mean, I can. I mean, can yeah, I? Yeah, let May we be drift let's over explore. here? Drift over here. So the um, this sort of ties the two worlds together. Was uh, I'm a, I'm a person that is a great believer in like a good riff is a good riff whenever it happens. Yeah. Um, for example, like the the riff for the opening riff of Bomb Track, that little do 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 do. I wrote that when I was 19 years old and a uh, college freshman at Harvard. Put it on that same Radio Shack tape, and I thought one day this is going to rock people. Similarly, <laughs> on the Atlas Underground record, there's a song called Vigilante Nocturna, which is played with this guitar, is in drop D tuning, and I wrote that riff riff during the. Evil Empire sessions in Atlanta in 1994. And again, it didn't find sort of fertile ground there. Yeah. So I stuck it in my back pocket and knew that one day it would rock people. And that day has come because it goes like this. <laughs>
<laughs> it definitely rocks. And that leads me to ask a question because anything you've played, it's always Tom. It's always, no matter what band or kind of, it, your, your voice comes out. So how, using the guitars that we've associated with you yeah, for yeah, years, yeah, yeah. how, do you, how do you, have you found and continued to foster your voice? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think part of it was, was sort of being true to myself and that, like, I'm a, I love riff rock, sort of, but the riff rock of less so of kind of the Metallicas and the Sepultura's and more so of the Jimmy Page and the uh, Tony Iommi's and the Deep Purples, uh, the, the, the Richie Blackmore's, like those riffs were the ones that really spoke to me. So my playing is, I think it's sort of, it's threefold. One, it's that kind of riffage, that sort of 70s riffage, uh, heavy single note, pentatonic bass riffage. Uh, the second part is, you know, I practice for, you know, eight hours a day for a lot of years. Yeah. So I have kind of that, the technique under my fingers. Um, but then it was like in the early days of Rage Against the Machine, I self-identified as the DJ in the band. So it was, it was uh, deconstructing the instrument and looking at it in a very, very different way to create sounds that were not traditional guitar sounds, yeah. but that were sounds that were my own. Were there any DJs going back to that point with starting the band that, that you yeah. thought about? Yeah, that? absolutely. I mean, it was a lot of it was was um, was the Public Enemy production, like the Bomb Squad production, which was mm. so sort of disjointed, and it was these crazy collages that they made with samples. But I was like, well, if I could approximate some of that, those rhythms and those textures and those sounds, it would definitely get me out of the rut of trying to sound like Randy Rhodes or Eddie Van Halen or Keith Richards or Chuck Berry. Yeah. yeah. And man, I think with the record, people hopefully have been listening to it. If they're not, this is the cue to do it. Is it's a Trojan horse of sorts yes. of, of bringing guitar back. Yeah. Because I know with the Night Watchmen, you, you've gone acoustic and yeah, non-string yeah, yeah, before, yeah, yeah. but. With this, it's back. It's back to your home. Yeah, home I mean, base. The, the the idea was to to make a record for 2018 that was an unapologetic rock and roll record, unapologetic guitar record, um, but but it had some of the sonic elements. And it's a the record I look at is it like it's a sonic conspiracy. And so uh, it's my guitar playing, but it's married with bass nectar and knife party and big boy and killer Mike and Wu Tang Clan and Portugal the man and uh, some friends new and old to. And really, like Trojan Horse, I think is the right way to describe yeah. it, to introduce a new generation of people who might otherwise be drawn to only making music on laptops to picking up an electric guitar again and teach them the joys of shredding. We've got a song, you know, one of the songs on the record is that, you know, sort of on alternative radio. And it's the first time in many, many years that there's been a song on alternative radio that had a blessed guitar solo. <laughs> we we need as much overdue. stuff as we can get, <laughs> my friend. And that, and that speaks to the collaboration you said with Knife Party and, and then with uh, that track being Battle Sirens and, yeah, yeah. On, and also. Uh, Rabbit's Revenge is like. Sure. How, what was that like collaborating with such EDM-based? Sure, sure. Artists? I mean, well, different different ways that have. I, I'll, I'll play a little bit of the uh, the Rabbit's Revenge song, which was Bass Nectar, Big Boy, and Killer Mike. So, so you know, I set Lauren, is Bass Nectar's name. Sat down with him in my studio, and we tried a bunch of different riffs, and nothing was really tickling his fancy. So I was just warming up, and I started <laughs> played played this just. <laughs> And he said, what's that? And I said, that's me warming up. And he said, did we record it? I said, I think we did. He said, that's the song. I think we're good. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So we just took like, we took that, used that as like the main cornerstone. And then he put a huge beat in it and we sent it over to Big Boy and Killer Mike and they, you know, rapped on top of it. And that one came together pretty quickly once we found that little, had that good luck to, for me to be warming up like that. And that was kind of the, was that the kind of sound, same, same kind of synergy that was with like Battle Slayers. Well, Battle Slayers was different. I mean, each of the songs on this record was made in a different way. Like, I think that, um, like when you, when you're in a band and it's good, it's good because of the band's chemistry. And together you can create something together that you can't individually. When you're a solo artist and it's good, it's good because of the purity of vision. Mm -hmm. And this record, I want to have the best of both worlds. Like, I'm the curator of the record. The the musical vision and the lyrical o overarching vision are mine, but then in each of the individual songs, they can let their freak flag fly and the chemistry yeah. of working with the particular musicians happen. So with Knife Party, I sent them a, um, like a, like a riff tape, like here's seven hot riffs and seven crazy noises and seven squeals and squonks. I said, use that as the sonic, get, lose some of the synthesizers and use those as the sonic building blocks to do, start your production with. And then we went back and forth. So it was really fun. This is my ninth, The Atlas Underground is my 19th studio record and one that I made, I want to challenge myself, you know, as a guitarist, as an artist, and as a record maker. Killer, man. And so I feel like that's enough talk in the Telecaster. Yes, we're going to move on over yeah, to the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Arm of Homeless. Sure, sure, sure. And this was an all time favorite, is also. This one is, uh, been with me for. 30 years now, Man. and the uh, 
history of this guitar is spotty. Uh, <laughs> when I <laughs> when I first moved to Hollywood, I I you know I wanted to have a custom made guitar because Steve Vai and some of my favorites had a custom made guitar. So I went to a, a guitar shop with my first check that I got from my first real job and. And I plunk, and they totally they skinned me. Like, yeah, I mean, it was a huge ripoff. It was probably the worst guitar that I've ever played. And I, I chose, but it was my own fault. He's like, I chose the fretboard, and I chose this, that, and the other. And but I'm not a luthier. I have no idea yeah. whether it should be ash or well, I have no idea. So I got this stinky guitar, and over the course of the next feels like in 1986, over the 87, the course of the next years, couple years, I tore it apart entirely. The only thing remaining from that original guitar is this piece of wood, right? So it's had a million different necks. This neck I found in a bin, like a, a, a throwaway bin at Nadine's Music on wow. Santa Monica Boulevard. It's had multi pickup, different pickups through the years, different whammy pedals, all the electronics are completely different. I put this like fat head thing on the back because I thought it would give it more sustain. It didn't work, but I left it on. Um, and then finally, like I, I I, I, honestly, like I gave up. I was trying to get a guitar that would be my perfect sound and was banging my head against the wall and just said, I'm going to stop right now. This is going to be my guitar and I'm just going to create with what I've got. Make it work. And that was, and that was very liberating because it was no longer chasing sounds. It was embracing the sound I had and using that to make music. And so that's been essentially the way it's set up this now. Is, is yeah, for, this is, the, I mean, on all 19 of my records, this guitar, this guitar features prominently, you know. Every show I've ever played, you know, for thousands of shows, this is the guitar, has been my, has been my main guitar for songs that are in standard, standard tuning. One thing that Perry had mentioned is, do you go through a lot of toggle switches? Because what yeah, you yeah, do... Yeah, yeah, well, should I, well, yeah, a little toggle it. demonstration yeah. here. So, I mean, one of the things, you know, when I was the, um, uh, uh, DJ in Rage Against the Machine, one thing you have to learn to do when you're a DJ is to scratch. Yeah. So, uh, uh, at the time when I got this guitar, like the coolest guitars were the Eddie Van Halen ones that had one pickup and one volume knob. So I was stuck with a guitar that had a toggle switch and a bunch of knobs, which was super uncool. So I thought, is there some way to make this work for me? Yeah. Um, and the toggle switch thing is, uh, you know, it's basically this pickup is, the volume is turned to zero. So you hear nothing, and then this pickup, it's turned to 10. So when you go between the two, it works as a kill switch, as an mm. on-off switch, right? So if you, you know, create some sort of sound and then rhythmically work the toggle switch like you're picking a guitar, you can create sounds that are reminiscent of a DJ scratching. <laughs> And then by simply adding something like a slide, which is used in a non-traditional manner in this way, it's just generating any sort of tone with the guitar can then be manipulated with the toggle switch. Do you ever mess around with different types of slides or uh, like metals or anything? Or is that no, just I complain sometimes because they're like too chubby, but this one's pretty good right here. This was <laughs> <laughs> what about strings on this one? Strings on this one, it's uh, custom lights. It's uh, 9 to 45, uh, or 40, uh, yeah, 9 to 45, and um, or 9 to 46. And what's light. the, the nine to 46. reason behind the that? The reason behind that is just uh, it seemed to work better uh, with, the, with the locking nut for me. Okay. And I, because I'm not tuning down for this, it uh, pr provides sort of like a a springiness in the ease, an ease in bending without having the tens on there. So. Cool, and I assume those are just EMG. Yeah, the EMGs. And again, all of the all of the much of the riffage in my career is done on the the front one, which is a it's a single coil disguised as a humbucker. Oh, uh, yeah, it's just you know like. Uh, and then uh, um, pretty much strictly for soloing do I go to the other. Gotcha. Go to the other. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, uh, we'll keep you when we go to the pedal board, but sure. I do definitely want to talk about the nylon sure. string here. That's I'm familiar sure. with like Night Watchmen. Yep. And obviously I know that big Woody Guthrie fan. Yep, yep, yep. So um, this is uh, a nylon string guitar that uh, is my, sort of my main acoustic vehicle. And, you know, I made four solo records under the name The Night Watching, which are basically, you know, sort of Americana slash political folk records. And I, I, I've always been a fan of heavy music 
and first it was metal, and then it was punk, and then it was hip hop, but then it was sort of later in my listening life that I discovered Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska record, the first couple Dylan records, and dug back to Woody Guthrie and uh, uh, Phil Oaks and people like that, uh, and Steve Earle, and realized that you can make music, like perhaps the heaviest music is often very quiet, mm. and it requires just sort of the right lyrical couplet and the right couple of chords to be devastatingly heavy, you know, as heavy as a wall of Marshall stack. Yeah. So that's why I started doing the Night Watchman stuff, which I really loved. And a lot of the songs, um, you know, throughout my electric career were written on a nylon string acoustic hmm. uh, because at, in, living in an apartment in Hollywood, you couldn't exactly, you know, crank up yeah. the stack at, you know, 3.15 in the morning when inspiration strikes. So a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the bit like for, um, I mean, this is a song that was written, this, this was written on a nylon, not this one, but one identical. <laughs> Writing that, I remember like coming up with that on the nine string again. Put it on the Radio Shack recorder, and in my mind, I could just picture like a field of Argentinians jumping up and down <laughs> of that, you know, at some point, like in the in the dark silence of my little apartment. I knew that that was maybe going to happen one day. So, what uh, what <laughs> strikes you about the nylon string versus like using yeah, a I mean, standard it really steel was, string? Yeah, it was it was a matter of habit. My my girlfriend, who's now my wife, she uh, had a nylon string guitar. That was the one that was in our apartment, oh. and so that was the one that I played and got so accustomed to the. Um, I don't know, sort of the soft feel of the strings, yeah. and uh, so then when I started doing my singer-songwriting, it was the guitar that I wrote my first couple songs on, and just kept on from there. Cool. Yeah. And then, uh, what songs do you play with that? Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, the, a lot of the, some of the songs on the on the Atlas Underground record, for example, "Every Step That I Take," uh, was written, which uh, Matt Schultz from Cage the Elephant, and myself, wrote, was uh, was written. You know, just sitting around with two acoustic guitars, like. <laughs> Becomes this kind of throbbing EDM rock monster on the record, but it started very much yeah, like a, a campfire jam. Because like the solo on that song, we saw it certain cell check, but yeah, it's, it's in the record. It's, it's yeah, it's electrified. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to say the yeah, least. We can play that when we go down to the pedal. Killer. Section. Well, let, let's do that. Let's, sure, fantastic. We'll do that, and uh, we'll briefly hit on this Marshall that I know you've had for yes, years. Yes, yes. So this is. Uh, um, this head, a, a, again, it was around the same time when I finally gave up on my guitar there, trying to make it the one I wanted and, and decided it's going to be the one that I have. Um, I had a, uh, all of my gear was stolen on a uh, fateful Valentine's Day m many years ago, over 30 years ago, and I had a session the next weekend, so I had to go to this shop and just get what they had. Yeah. And what they had was a 50 watt, uh, Marshall channel switching head and a 4x12 PV cabinet. At the time, PV cabinet, you know, no offense, PV. PV was like, the first thing I had to do was like unscrew the PV thing on the front so people might mistake it for a Marshall cabinet. <laughs> you know, because like if you're a Hollywood musician, yeah. you couldn't be seen with PV. Anyway, but that I think it contributed to the sort of unique sound that it eventually became. Yeah. But again, I would spend hours trying to, you know, create a Nuno Betancourt tone or whatever and failing miserably till one day and you can see on here you could uh, if you want to yeah. come in at some point I in 1988 I spent few like two or three hours with that guitar and with this amp head in the PV cabinet and said this is as good as a tone I'm going to stop banging my head against the wall this is going to be my tone I marked the amp you can see the markings they're on there they're they're on there yeah. and I never changed them since I was just like, we're going to be done ever thinking about that or talking about that. This is going to be the tone, and I'm going to make songs with that tone. The end. Damn. And have you had to do anything to the amp, uh, you know, occasionally? I, you know what? It's, I think, like, occasionally, like, my guitar tech might change the tubes yeah. and not tell me. You know, probably they don't tell me. <laughs> um, but on this, too, the, the PV is not with it. It's, it's at home. The PV is not with us because we're sort of traveling light on this Atlas Underground tour. So any 4x12 will gotcha. approximate the sound. The sound is basically between the head, those guitars, and my fingers. Well, speaking of that, let's dive into your pedal board. Sure. Hear some more of that magic. Dive on in. Let's get magical. So the um, so the this is uh, this is it. 
basically. These are all the pedal, and this is kind of maybe more than are usually around. So the pedals that I've used for, I mean, the best, better part of three decades, it's an MXR Phase 90, which I only use for the beginning of killing in the name, you know? Like, it's, it's like one. <laughs> Other than that, it doesn't get turned out. That's it. It's got like it's a one. It's like a, it's like a pinch hitter. It's like a, a specialist. It yeah. comes in. Um, the EQ pedal I use exclusively for boost okay. on songs. So it's it's from back in the days of playing clubs when you couldn't trust the sound man to know when the guitar solo was going to come. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm going to take that out of your hands. I'm going to be loud when the guitar solo comes. You don't yeah. worry about that. I'm going to take care <laughs> of that. So it's set flat, str flat, and up okay. for that. Um, then I have two identical. Uh, delay pedals. One is for, uh, just so I don't have to change the settings mm. so much during the show. Uh, one is just sort of the long delay which accompanies all of the, you know. For your astral pleasure, right there. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, then the other one is, has, has like, there's only a total of three settings between these two, and this one sort of goes back and forth between this ping pong delay, which. Uh, <laughs> issues with having uh, like notes not sustaining for, for the finger tapping because sometimes guys will juice that with a, a boost pedal oh, to, to no, not have the notes no, I mean, drop I, out. I always use the, the only gain, the only gain is just the gain from the head, you yeah. know, which is, which is pretty substantial. Yeah. I just kind of smack down on it pretty hard there. Cool. Um, and then there's the, the, the whammy pedal, which is kind of the, one of the, uh, one of the things that really helped me break out of the niche of sounding like a bunch of other players. Uh, I never, w w um, could really wrap my head around rack gear, yeah. and I bought one piece of rack gear, and I couldn't even figure out how to plug it in. So I thought that's probably not for me. So when they had a harmonizer in a pedal, I thought, well, perhaps that's something that I could make work. And then it had. I found that in addition to the harmony settings, which you know include like the fifth, which is heard on songs such as "Know Your Enemy." <laughs> Like that, um, it had sort of a bonus little <laughs> thing was the was the octaves was the octave the two octaves up and that I would just like took great liberties to create sheets of white noise that could be manipulated in a lot of different ways. For example, during the song um, "Bullet in the Head," which goes. <laughs> And so it really was a matter of just looking at the guitar in a different way and like, okay, I've got a toggle switch and I can make some noise, so maybe something can happen. And then on a more melodic front um, uh, in the band Audio Slave, where we had more chord progressions and sort of prettiness going on, the a more sort of uh, soaring solo in Like a Stone went like. <laughs> Now I gotta go back to the octave, the two octave up. Is that something that you would use like on the very beginning, shortly, uh, like uh, you're the boomerang? 
in terms of that. Oh, that yeah, sure. I don't really remember how to play that one, but yeah. No, no, but just in terms of <laughs> yeah, like that. Like, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just wanted to. Yeah, yeah. It was, a ni- it was a nice sort of arrow to have in the quiver to be able to play these kind of, you know, dog's ear piercing, yeah. you know, sheets of white noise. That was just stuff. a personal thing because I've. I'm like, if I ever get time, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. asking that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So what else is that kind of the, your three different? Yeah, yeah. So then, then uh, yeah. Oh no, then there's the the short delay, which is written down here so handily. And that, you know, I would you know sort of mess around with a. Uh, Flat back delay, which provides some options. Cool. And how do you use the wah? And so the wah, I mean, I, I the bean rarely filter. use it in. I mean, sometimes I use it in like the the sort of traditional wah. You know. <laughs> sort of traditional shredding, bluesy, wahing ways. Uh, but I also found that it provided, uh, like it helped sort of in the in the scratching area. So when I scratch, I could put the, tr- click on the wah, depress it all the way, and it makes for even more of kind of like a white, noisy, you know. And then you can. Something like that, yeah. uh, and then uh, the uh, sort of the another sort of curious wah thing that happens is I found that if you this is just some sort of crazy electronic magic that occurs if you take the original Digitech whammy pedal, you turn it on, you set it to one oct- one or two octaves up, you turn it on, don't depress it, just leave it there. Mm-hmm. You turn your wah wah pedal on like that. Is it on? It, you turn it on. You unplug your guitar. You make a noise with that. You touch anything to that, and all of a sudden, craziness happens. You don't even need string. You don't even change your strings when you do that. Your, your strings will last forever. It's <laughs> pure experimentation. <laughs> And the last pedal here is sure. that you made a remark in the interview you did with PG about a month ago was uh, that this is your version of taking this pedal, putting it in your pedal board, <laughs> is to take back the sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this, is a, this is a Digitech Space Station, which was like sort of a somewhat crappy pedal that they came up with in the aftermath of my first two records. Yeah. Where they seem to have <laughs> gone through the sounds of those records and tried to put them in a pedal they could then sell to people without calling me about that. Um, uh, and so you're stealing this, them back. Is this on? Hey, uh, Brad, is this on? It's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. This, it, it's a, it creates a lot of like extra noise in the line, so we have it like completely separated, and gotcha. it's only we hit like the Megatron button when it's time to. Uh. Yeah. So um, what it is, I, I only use a couple of the settings because I find most of them are pretty unusable. Mm. But but there are some that you know are pretty cool, which is my on here. <laughs> Like you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's built in. You don't have to. <laughs> That'll save you years of practice. Just plug that thing in. <laughs> I see that you got Mr. Crowley here. You're big Randy Rose. Yeah, fan. yeah. How yeah, do you yeah. interpret that song through the set? Or is that you do uh, yeah, 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 pretty faithful? to the show to see that one. Yeah. Ah. You know what? I'll do. I'll do it for you. Want, can we do that? Aaron, are you here? Nope. I can do that for you. Well, just to say, is it like a faithful recreation? Or do you no, no. I just own? like when I when I used to when I was doing my eight hours of practice a day. Uh, two hours that was dedicated to technique, two hours dedicated to theory, two hours was dedicated to um, songwriting and song learning, and then two hours was dedicated to improvisation. And one of the things I would do is I would just make chord, long chord progressions of some of my favorite songs and yeah. just jam over them endlessly. And one of those was the Mr. Crowley chord, chord progression. So that was one that I 
cool. Yeah, that we do during the show. And and one last question I got: since you are playing with yourself with tracks behind you, do you miss having a band behind you? In the sense I, where you I have lots of opportunity to have bands behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I enjoy it. And this is the this is like the sort of the promo tour for Atlas Underground, where it's intimate venues. There's some a lot of discussion about sort of my career in the various bands, and then I shred my ass off. Um, in 2019, we're coming back with a proper tour, and there will be band, and it's all going to be happening. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom, thank you so much for not only bringing a guitar and making it cool in 1991, <laughs> but still making it cool in 2018 and beyond. Right on. I appreciate it. Thank you very it's much, Chris everybody. Chris from your guitar. Hey, everybody. Thanks for watching the latest Rig Rundown. Guess what? Every week, we upload a brand new Rig Rundown to PremierGuitar.com a full week before it's available here on YouTube. So to get your gear fix as soon as humanly possible, go to PremierGuitar.com forward slash Rig Rundown. And while you're there, be sure to sign up to get an email notification so you're the first to know as soon as each week's new rig rundown is available. Cheers. See you soon.